I know this is a shocking development today because I don't have a jacket on. But when you tell me that the AC is broken and it's summer and it feels like Houston outside, jacket comes off. I might use this as an excuse to just ease into not wearing jackets anymore. Who knows? I heard, I heard, I heard an amen here, so... Right. <laughs> I hope everyone is doing well today. I'm glad to see everybody here because this week we get to finish the book of Ruth in chapter 4. Last week we ended with Boaz committing to Ruth's good, telling her that he would do all that she needed. He would, he would do his part to make sure that she was taken care of. <coughs> Excuse me. But even in doing good, he must go through the proper channels. Because that God does give an order to things, and, it, and he gives us an order to things that we cannot ignore. When God says, do good and do it in this way, well, if we ignore how he, what he tells us to do, but we have the best of intentions, then we're not doing his will. If I say, oh, well, I'm going to go do this in my way how I want, then it very easily becomes about us, about our own agenda. And so in this case, if you remember, Ruth has asked Boaz to, to marry her. But there's someone closer that he has to go through first. And he's going to be talking to this man today. But Boaz has, 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 as I said, committed to Ruth's good, and that involves him becoming a kinsman redeemer. It involves redeeming her. And he's going to start by offering to redeem the land. In chapter 4, starting in verse 1, we read that Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken of came by. So Boaz said, come aside, friends, sit down here. So he came and sat down. And Boaz took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of, country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to do it, and I am next after you. So we have, starting off here in the first, oops, four verses, it is a day. In the first four verses, him telling the relative, hey, Naomi's back and her land needs to be redeemed. Now it is in this time the right and the duty of the family to redeem land. When I say redeem land, I mean buy it back. You do this in the, in the event of a family member's death so that the land did not disappear from the family. See, this helped to keep a society stable so that there would always remain land for a family line. When God established Israel and Canaan, he gave them very specific rules, very specific laws about property. And one of those laws was kind of boiled down to land stays within a family, ultimately. And if they sell that land for whatever reason, after a certain amount of time has passed, it reverts back to the family. This is important because it enables a family, if something happens, you know, two or three generations ago, or even in the previous generation, it enables the family to have a place to live, have a way of life. 
And so it's very important that this land be redeemed. But Boaz knows that he's not the closest relative here, and so he offers the opportunity to the rightful heir. He offers the opportunity to the one who has, who has the right to do this. But there's something else very important that he does, that he does here, and I want, you, I want you to notice. Boaz informs that he will redeem it if the, if the other relative does not want to. This is going to become very important in the next section. <clears throat> Boaz did not you know, go into this without any sort of plan. He knows what he's doing. And so he's offered to redeem the land if, if the relative does not want to. So in verses 5 through 12, we, we find out, or sorry, right, sorry, right before verse 5, the relative said, I will redeem it. So this is good. The relative says, yeah, no problem. I'll take care of it. But in verse 5, Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of, hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot do it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning rede redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off the sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilian's and Malin's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malin, I have acquired as my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from, from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make this woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, and may you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be, to, be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So now we have Boaz redeeming a name. Again, it was the right and duty of the closest relative to perpetuate the family of a childless widow. It is important in this time to perpetuate the family. Because in the event of tragedy, a, fa a family line could be ended in an instant. And so this kept families from dying out due to tragic circumstances, but this relative is concerned <clears throat> because if he takes on this other woman as his wife, well, that child is going to get, well, not only the inheritance from Ruth's dead husband's side, but also from his side. And so I don't, we, we're not told what kind of, you know, inheritance plans or 401ks or anything else like that he had coming up. But he knows it's going to mess it up, mess it up. and so he says, you know, I don't, I don't want that. Uh, I can't do that. Go ahead and take care of it. It was very dishonorable and very shameful to refuse to redeem one's widow. This affected, this, would af this decision would affect an entire family. And it would affect all future generations of that family. Basically, if, if someone refuses to do this, they're saying, well, my life is more important than my brother's family line. That's a big problem. In Deuteronomy 20, chapter 25, Starting in verse 5, this, this, this is uh, 
This is what happens. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as a wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name will not be blotted out of Israel. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then the brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, So it shall be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel the house of him who had his sandal removed. Pretty big. This is how serious it is to redeem a name. Realize at this time that women don't have standing. Women and children don't really have standing. And so this woman takes off his sandal and spits in his face and curses him. This is how serious, this is how big of a deal it is to redeem a name in Israel. This is a major thing. But remember, <clears throat> what I told you to remember earlier, Boaz has already given him an honorable way out. A grown man in Israel would know the laws. He would know the consequences of saying, you know, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> not only does he get, get his face spit on, his, his family name is going to be tarnished. But Boaz has offered an honorable way out by saying, hey, if you don't want to, tell me so that I can do it. So now we have a way, he has a way to escape. <clears throat> And in, in this situation, God uses it to redeem all life. Let's read 13 through the end of the, through the, end of the book. So Bo Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her. The Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. And then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and cared for him. Also the neighbor women gave him, gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashan, Nashan begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. At this point in Scripture, if you haven't you know, read ahead, It seems like, hey, this is a happy ending to this, to this story. This is a happy ending to this family. And that's true, it is. Boaz marries Ruth. They have a son. His name is Obed. Naomi has her family restored. Ruth has her family restored. All of the hardship and the struggle and the pain and the destruction of their families has been redeemed. It's been restored. But the story doesn't stop there, does it? Our Bible doesn't end 
and Ruth. You see, Israel is restored. During the time of the judges, Israel is continually and constantly falling away, walking away from God. One of the themes in Judges is that, is that every man did what was right in his own eyes. It's kind of one of the recurring statements in Judges. <clears throat> Until they eventually, eventually they say, hey, we want a king. And God allows them to have Saul. And Saul does, does pretty well until he doesn't. But then David comes to the throne. David, the man after God's own heart. David, the man who makes huge, enormous, country-wide affecting mistakes, but continues to chase after and come back to God. It's during this time that Israel is at one of the high points of its existence. They're victorious in battle. They are following God. They are worshiping their one true creator. They're being led by someone who desires God. And it starts with Ruth, or for our purposes here. But it doesn't stop there. The story doesn't stop there. The story doesn't stop with David. Because ultimately, mankind is restored. <clears throat> what was the promise that God made with David? What was the covenant that he made with him? I will give you a king that will sit on your throne forever. I will give you one who will do it all. And that promise to David comes to fruition in Christ. The story of Ruth doesn't stop in Ruth chapter 4. It continues through the kings. It continues through Jesus the Messiah. This story is continuing today. Because God's plans do not allow darkness to last forever. Remember in the first chapter of Ruth, they flee from a famine. While they are gone, Naomi's husband dies, her sons get married, and then they die. Naomi has lost everything. She has nowhere to go. She gets back. Remember in chapter 1? When, the, when, the, when all the people say, hey, Naomi is back. <clears throat> she said to them, do not call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. <clears throat> Naomi starts in a place of darkness, in a place of despair. <clears throat> and in that place, in that time, it wasn't everyone else's job to correct any incorrect theology. It wasn't anyone's job to say, oh well, it's better, it's all in God's plan, it'll be fine. We can do that when people can see clearly. But if you've ever been in the midst of despair, if you've ever been in the midst of darkness, if you've ever been in the midst of intense tragedy, it's difficult to see clearly the truth. There is always a plan that God has and he will not allow darkness to last forever. Naomi's in a dark place in chapter 1. 
But as time goes on, as Ruth continues to give herself to, give herself to her mother-in-law, Naomi starts to see more clearly, right? She starts to see the light. She can start to see her God once again. She has not been left alone. And now in the end, God has fully redeemed her. And He fully redeems us. He does not leave us to dwell in darkness. He does not leave us to dwell in despair. When we're in the middle of it, it can seem that way sometimes. But in holding on to faith, we can see that his plans go much further than we realize. When Naomi is in Moab, I doubt she's thinking as her husband and her sons die, I doubt that she's thinking, oh, I bet God is going to use this to save the world one day. I doubt even here. Now that her family has been restored, Ruth has a husband, they have a son, she has a grandchild, she knows that her family is going to live through more generations. Even now, I doubt she's th seeing her thinking, oh, I bet God's going to save the world through this child. And yet... Isn't it, isn't, isn't it interesting how throughout Scripture, God's plans always go much further than we ever seem to realize? Like I said, if, if we hadn't read past Ruth yet, we don't know who David is. Oh yeah, it's just another, uh, just another chronology, just a bunch of names, you know, Perez, Hezron, Aminadab, Nashan, Salmon, Bo Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David. Okay, a bunch of names. We can skip over those real quick. And yet, these are, some of the, these are some of the names that God is using to bring salvation to the world. I would wager that whatever darkness you have seen, whatever darkness you have been through, whatever despair you may feel, that God's plans go much further than you realize. Because he will not allow darkness to last forever. He does not go part way with redemption. He fulfills it. <laughs> Understand this. God has redeemed. In the book of Ruth, he's enabled Ruth and her family to be redeemed. But make no mistake, He has done the same for us. Because He has redeemed our land. And when I say He has redeemed our land, I mean He has redeemed our possessions for His glory. When, you were, when your land in ancient Israel is your property, is what you own, it is what you use, it is where you live. It is all, it is, when you say my land, you're basically saying all my stuff everything I own. All your stuff, everything you own, has been redeemed by God. And it is not our right to hold that back from Him. It is not our right to say to God, well, this is my money and this is your portion of it. This is my house and this is your part of it. This is my family and this is the time you can have with them. That's not our right. God has bought it all. And he has bought it all with the blood of Christ. And as such, all that we have is to be used for his glory for his purpose. And he allows us to make use of it. He allows us to enjoy the things that he has blessed us with, but ultimately it's not ours. It all 
belongs to him. It can only belong to him. Because he has also redeemed our name. My name, outside of Christ, is worthless. Seriously. I have a super good credit score. I'm, I'm really proud of it. It's worthless outside of Christ. Your name outside of Christ is worthless. Remember, remember in Romans, Paul, Paul writes, while we were enemies, while we were sinners, while we were against God, Christ died for us. I don't know about you, but I don't generally like my enemies very much. I'll be honest, I'm human. You be honest too, you probably don't like your, even if you say, I love my enemies as God commands me to, chances are you're not going to ask them out to dinner tomorrow. Okay, let's be honest here. <laughs> and yet, while we were enemies, God sent Christ to buy our worthless name. A name in ancient cultures is descriptive of w what you are, who you are, who you belong to, where you came from, where you were going. God has bought, has bought all that. And so our name has worth. Our name has value. Our name is treasured because it's been taken from the position of enemy and been put in the position of child. God. And that is a great thing. Because ultimately, God has redeemed our life. And all that makes up who we are is now His. It can be no one else's. Little kids sing that, that song, head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Hayden used to love that song, sing it like constantly. Now it's stuck in my head, great. I apologize if it's stuck in your head. But from your head to your shoulder to your knees to your toes, God has bought it all. Paul writes that we are not our own, we are bought with a price. And that price was far greater than we were worth. It was far greater than we could ever pay. If we spent all day, every day, if we took pills so that we never had to sleep, and we stayed up 24 hours a day and seven days a week, we were focused on doing nothing but the will of God constantly, all the time, no matter what, we still could not redeem ourselves. We still could not pay the price. But God could, and God has. And if he has bought our life, if he has bought our name, if he has bought our land, then there's nothing left that we can say, this is mine. There is nothing we have, there is nothing we are that we can say, well, God, you can have all this, but this is mine. There's nothing left. He's bought it all. And we are those who live in redemption. What great news to spread. What great news to live. That that which was worthless, that which, that which had nothing, that which had nothing to its name has all been purchased by God. And if you've not given that to him, if you've not been redeemed by the blood of Christ, if you've not been washed in the waters of baptism, been washed in his blood to have your sins forgiven, if you have not 
received his spirit, then the call for redemption is now. God doesn't say, hey, do it someday down the line when you know everything. Hey, do this someday down the line when you're a better person. Do this someday down the line when you don't have any burdens. What does Jesus say? Come to me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The weight of your land, the weight of your name, the weight of your life is too heavy for you to carry alone. I know because I've tried. And every once in a while, I still try, and it's still too heavy. If you need redemption, then come. If you need to remember who you are and whose you are, then it's time to repent. It's time to confess. It's time to come back to the God who has purchased you. He calls us to him, one and all. So that all that we have and all that we are may be used for his glory so that he may bless us and love us as only he can do. The time is now. So won't you come as we stand and as we sing.